general, what are we at mixed grades or seniors only? Anybody not a senior? Okay. Um, a couple of different things we'll get into it here. Um, if you go to college next or if you go work next, whichever you go do after high school, you will be asked or told <laughs> to go to something like a training session or a development session or something that helps you get better in your profession. And so I go to these two, I go because of because I want to go. But uh, it's healthy for you to ask who is this person and what do they know. You don't have to ask it out loud. That's kind of rude. But ask yourself inside, you know, who is this person talking, what do they know, are they qualified to be talking about this? So I'm going to give you like a two minute soliloquy about myself that you won't be tested on. You don't need to remember any of this, but I'm just going to tell you. Uh, so as Ms. Kearney introduced, I'm Dr. St. John. I have a doctorate in conducting, orchestral conducting. Uh, but prior to that, doctorate, I'm going to go backward in time. I got my doctorate at Arizona State University. Uh, before I got my doctorate, I worked 15 years as a professional conductor in near Boulder, Colorado. I also taught public school. At the same time, I was conducting three different symphony orchestras around Boulder County, Colorado. I also taught in public school, so I taught seven different orchestras or conducted seven different orchestras per week for a period from 1999 to 2003. I tell my students, and anybody who listens to me, uh, if you want to be a busy professional, be careful what you wish for, because I was busy. And among the things that I did besides um, teaching strings, I'm a viola player, teaching strings, I, and conducting these orchestras, I also wrote and premiered seven ballets, fully staged ballet. Uh, they were designed for youth, meaning that the orchestra were high school students and the dancers were high school students, and we would bring in mentors to work with them. But it was the only program that I know of like it in the United States, if not the entire world, where original ballet was written and premiered for young people to execute. Um, I didn't set out to do that. I didn't sit down at home and say, gee, I'd really like to write a ballet. And remember, we're going backwards in time here. So now we're talking about 1999. This is a while ago. My then wife, my then wife at the time was a professional ballet dancer. We met my first job in Kansas City, Missouri as assistant conductor for the ballet there, the Kansas City Ballet. So I was assistant conductor, which meant I didn't do anything. I just sat around and learned. Um, we all do that, by the way, at some point in life. You don't really want to go, have to go do something that you don't know how to do. Like, hey, get in there and do surgery. Uh, anyway, and so I sat around and learned about just how to be a conductor and how ballet works. I had never even seen uh, the Nutcracker Ballet, which is the most famous ballet in America. I'd never even seen it by the time I was an assistant conductor for a company, so it was all new to me. Um, she and I met and uh, a long time ago, and we got married, and we moved to Colorado because we had work there. And so we bought this failing dance studio, this little dance studio that was just going out of business. It had like 40 kids that went to it. A year and a half later, it had 250 kids. A year and a half later, it had 400 kids that went to it. And so I was at a conducting camp. Again, you go to things where you learn and you get some uh, professional development. She called me at this camp I was at in northern Idaho. And she said, hey, I got the grant. And I said, what grant? She said, I got this donation for you to have your youth orchestra dance, I mean play, while my dancers dance. And I said, well, that sounds really cool. And she said, well, I put in the grant, you're going to write a ballet. And I said, you did what? <laughs> she said, I put in the grant, you're going to write a ballet. And I said, what makes you think I want to write a ballet? She said, oh, you're a great musician. You'll figure it out. So I said, I'll do it one time. That's it. I wound up doing it actually seven more times. I've written eight now, total. Okay, anyhow, uh, life changes happened and that um, marriage ended about over 10 years ago. And I was conducting one of my ballets and one of the guest artists, not a high school kid, underline, guest artists, was mentoring the students and she and I met and now we're married. So uh, we met years ago and now I'm married to yet another ballet dancer, isn't that weird? How does that happen? But I guess if you wind up hanging around them, you know, enough, these are the people you wind up meeting. So my now wife, Krista, is, uh, was on faculty at Western, uh, but she's left to go get another college degree. So she's actually at the University of Oklahoma as junior faculty there. And we're spending the next two and a half, three years in two different places trying to make that work. Um, so 
what all this means is that I have this kind of funny background about music and dance that when I was your age, meaning a senior in high school, I never would have imagined. I knew I wanted to be a musician. I knew I wanted to be a conductor, even. I knew that. And rather than paying attention at some of my classes, <clears throat> I was in the back of the room with my music book, learning how to do things like write for oboe or bassoon or whatever came to mind that I didn't know. I should have paid a little more attention to other classes, but that's what my head was. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit and show you some examples, because it's kind of fun to do both here, um, about music and dance. Culturally speaking, every civilization that we know of around the world, how big or small, has music. Not every civilization that we know of has drugs and alcohol. Not every civilization can make their own sort of intoxicants like drugs and alcohol, but every civilization has music that we know of. So music is something that is absolutely in our DNA as a species. We need it. We need music. You hear babies start to coo and make musical sounds from the time that they can start to verbalize and audiate, they can respond to music. Along with that, dance is in our DNA. If you get some little kids around who know nothing about and play some music, they will start dancing to music. There is just something about us as a species. We need music and we want to move to it. So dance, as far as ballet goes, which I'm going to show you a little bit about here, um, ballet is this formalized sense of dance, just like if you were to watch a symphony orchestra play, they're looking at a piece of notation and music and it's a formalized sense of notation. Uh, this, as an art form, comes back from France in the 1600s with King Louis 13 into 14. As a matter of fact, King Louis, the Sun King, they called him that because <laughs> he had uh, commissioned, he had paid for a ballet to be written that was an overnight ballet. It took seven hours, the ballet. And at the end of the seven hours, when the sun rose, King Louis made his appearance and came out and danced for the crowd. And that's how he got this nickname, the Sun King. Now that's a bit, you know, much, right? Can you imagine? But back in the day, this was a major form of entertainment. We have France and Russia as these two big places where ballet takes root and people go nuts for it. Um, in France, they even had a thing called horse ballet. Think about that for a second. Horse ballet. Now, if your cartoon brain, just imagine a horse with a tutu and a, a tutu and a tiara, that's not it. Um, it's more like what we think of as dressage today. If you know what that is, right? Horses that kind of move in certain gating with uh, music playing sometimes. And so they, this was a big deal too <laughs> back in France in the 16 to 1700s and a little bit beyond the 1700s where composers would write music for symphony orchestras to play while horses came out and their riders had them dance to the music. We call this horse ballets. So this is how much of a big deal this was. This is probably the most famous ballet piece ever written. And if you'll notice at the top of the cliff, the audience is already in mid applause. In certain places, I'm gonna get everywhere so you can see. And because you're kind of having to look through my big head to see this. Um, you're gonna hear the audience go ballistic before it's even started. And um, we'll play it through, it's short. And then I'll tell you a few things about what you just saw. So I'm gonna have you watch it, and I'm gonna tell you what, what you just saw. And then we may do it again. You're gonna go on the A, B? Yeah. Okay. Fuentes. 
all have their own turn. And it's heavy to be married to a ballet dancer. here and her back leg was flat at 90 degrees from her front leg. And so what I talk about with college students is it's like it's up to you the amount of investment you want to make to seeing it. But I can tell you that the more you know about what you're looking at, the more fun it is to look at it. Because you're just getting this one layer deeper into what's in front of you. Going to ballet can be sort of like watching a painting in real life. If you don't know what you're looking at, you're kind of like, oh, that's kind of nice. <laughs> and that's all right. I'm totally cool with that. Uh, now, so coming back to Nutcracker, what I do, and I encourage any music student to do this who is conducting, th what I do with scores, right, and this is not to insult anybody's intelligence in the room, I don't know what you know, so I'm just going to talk. Um, so what I do from a conducting standpoint is I read all of this simultaneously. This is the orchestra score. Flutes, brass, I mean flutes, woodwinds, brass, percussion, strings. And we, are, we learn over time and they're trained to read it all simultaneously. So if you hear a wrong note, you go, oh, violas, that should be a D sharp or whatever. Um, and so this ends this movement, and then this movement begins here. And this is a piece we're doing with the Western Orchestra on our holiday concert coming up. It's just a three minute little piece, pretty simple form. And after a while you learn, like I said, how to read all this simultaneously. So in the score, what I do is inside the front page most of the time, I write my name, but then when I got a hold of the score, when I bought the score. So in here, I've had this score for a long time. I've had it since August of 1996. That's a long time. See, I'm, I'm 49 years old now, so I've had this for quite some time in my life. But also, besides writing your name inside when you bought it, inside the front cover, I write when I conducted the piece in concert with whom, what orchestra and what date, what year. So I keep track of it. It's sort of like a journal. You know, in the way, like, 
if I get out a piece or if I'm asked to go somewhere and conduct a piece, I, I write it down. I have a resume that I write it down, but I also write it in the score. This also keeps me from accidentally thinking, oh, I should do this piece with this orchestra, and then I go, oh, I just did it two years ago. I shouldn't do it that soon. Again, I should do something different. So you can see how many times I've done this piece. Not a lot, a few times over going back between 1996 and then next week, or two weeks from now, 2018, it'll be four. I'll, after, I'm superstitious. After I perform it, I write down the date. I don't write it until the show happens. All right, so that being said, Nutcracker Ballet. Again, take a snapshot mentally. Okay. Here's the Nutcracker Ballet score. And then, <coughs> here's how many times I've conducted it. <laughs> Down to here. Now I'm on this new page over here. So this goes all the way back to December 2nd and 3rd, 1995. The first ballet I soloed, where I was at, uh, I was 26 years old. It was the first time that I conducted the production of the ballet on my own, not as a assistant conductor. And almost every year since 1995, two exceptions. 20, 2010, no, 2009, and 2018 this year are the only two years I haven't done any of this. So you can tell that I know the piece fairly well at this point. As a matter of fact, what I've done in the back is I've shoved in just, and I've left and they're actually thrown away. There's like um, inserts and some old programs and clippings and pay rosters and stuff like that that I've just thrown in here that I should probably throw away. So this ballet, of uh, Tchaikovsky's was the third of his three ballets. Swan Lake was first, then Sleeping Beauty, and then Nutcracker. And Nutcracker happens later in his life, and it's the shortest. Swan Lake is pretty long. If you go see the whole thing, it's like two plus three hours long, depending on how much of it they do. Sometimes they chop it up. Nutcracker is the most concise. It's two 50-minute acts. You go in for 50 minutes, you watch act one, you leave for intermission, you come back, watch act two. It's really well balanced. But it was not a big hit in Russia. It became a big hit in the United States in 1950 with a guy named Balanchine, who's a choreographer. Um, Balanchine decided to reproduce this ballet that had basically been covered in dust. Nobody wanted to touch it. And then because he did it in New York City with his little new ballet company in 1950, people went nuts for it. They thought it was ideal. You can take kids to it. It's not too long. It's kind of fun to watch, the tunes are great. And uh, then, because he did that in 1950, we have all across the United States companies doing it everywhere around the holidays. That's not the same, though, in every other country. Like in Europe, it's rarely done still. Russia, of all places, it's rarely done still. But the United States, it's done everywhere. It's the big money maker for most ballet companies. Now the next thing I want to show you is that with, my, with her permission, I brought for you some point sheets. These are ones that she's never used. And um, in case you did not know, uh, they go up on their toes. Uh, Krista has tiny feet, my wife. She has tiny feet. She's five foot four and 100 pounds, and she has these little teeny feet. Um, so they go up on the, see these are kind of stained. That's why I said, can I take the ones that are stained? I don't know how they got stained, but she said sure. Um, so that is a, a box. So when they go up on their toes, they're actually up on the box of the shoe. Yeah. And so this, everything also has a name, by the way. Uh, this, the link here is called the vamp. This is called the shank back here. And um, what you do is you can cut the shank so that your foot points better. So you look like you have more of an arch in your foot. And Krista does. Krista would be the first one to say where she goes. She doesn't have great arches. And that's part of the thing in ballet is you want to see what your arches look like, what your point looks like. And so she will happily slice. Some of them cut it off entirely. They have no shank support back here. They'll just take a knife and slash it right off. Um, then what they do, and again, we'll see as well, I'll show you more. Uh, some will put, uh, they'll darn it. They'll put a little um, thread here because they get a little more grip on the floor with their toes. The floor is covered with something called marley. It's kind of like a rubberized floor that they either can roll out or sometimes just build onto the stage. Underneath that, there's these little neoprene cubes under wood to make it a sprung floor so that they're not just going straight into a hard surface. The floor has a little give so that they don't get shin splints and injuries and that sort of thing. Um, what they will then do, this is the way you buy point shoes straight out of the catalog or store. 
then they will sew ribbon and elastic. The elastic band over the arch of their foot, the ribbon goes up and around the ankle, but not up the calf. It just goes around the ankle. And then you're supposed to, by the way, tie off the ribbon and tuck the knot, and then they usually will spray hairspray on the knot to keep it from fly, flopping out. If it flops out, they get fined $100. Uh -huh. If you're wearing the wrong earrings, another $100. If your hair is not in the right bun, another $100. Then companies are like that. It's like being in the military. You have to follow exactly. The dress code, you have to follow exactly. And for as little as they get paid, <clears throat> $100 is a lot of money. As my wife would say, other than it being physically abusive, low pay, and emotionally exhausting, it's a great profession. Other than that. So what I'm gonna do is just pass this around so you can, they're not, they've not been warned, don't worry, they don't smell like sweat or anything like that. Just pass it around, take a second look at it. So what they will do with the point shoes, what they will do with the point shoes is they will sometimes take it as they get them brand new and they will whack them repeatedly on the ground to tenderize the point so that, because cramming your foot in there is very abrasive to your foot. And so they'll actually do this. Sometimes when I'm on the phone with her, I'll hear in the background, whap, 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 whap. And I'll ask her, are you breaking in these point shoes? She goes, yeah, okay. Um, and they also have uh, toe flows, which is this little sort of sleeve. You put your toe, your feet in, and then they also sometimes have spacers that they'll put between their toes, because essentially your whole body weight at one point or another is on this line from your hip through your knee, through your ankle, to your big toe joint. Essentially your whole body weight is on that. Okay, let's go to, X out of this here? These? Yeah, you just, just kill it, just X out, so we don't have to worry about heels. Okay, now, this next one. Good. We're going to do just a little hop, skip, and jump through this. So the first thing I showed you, the first thing I showed you was called a solo variation. And the most famous one in the world. You hear that music, excuse me, every holiday season when it comes time for selling insurance or Reese's peanut butter cups or whatever. You hear it in the background, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is one of the heavy hitters from the classical ballet world that I've seen a bunch of times, I have not conducted this once. I would like to, but I've just never been in the situation to conduct it. And we're gonna do, like I said, a hop, skip, and jump through this. Uh, this is considered to be what is called a grand pas de deux. Grand pas de deux, you can say it with me if you want, go ahead. Grand pas de deux, en français. Anyway, um, so grand, big. Pas de deux is group of two. So what this means is that this is a big chunk of this ballet act that's just set around two leads. So in the previous segment, you heard the audience just going ballistic for that dancer. Uh, even in a place like Kansas City, Missouri, when I was there many years ago as assistant conductor, they would have certain casts assigned to certain nights. So Sugar Plum was going to be this person that night. And audience members would show up to see certain dancers. They had groupies. Yes, I will only come to see if so-and-so is dancing. I will only come to see if so-and-so is dancing. This is born out of this huge tradition of featuring great artists. And so Grand Pas de Deux, Don Quixote, here is the story. And uh, these are two superstar dancers, but even back in the day when this was originally written, the choreographer would say, I want a Grand Pas de Deux. So that means usually that there's some kind of a slow dance for two of them, and then, a quick variation, so a variation for the man, for the woman, and then they would sometimes have a, a pas de deux at the end that's fast, kind of sums it all up. So we're going to show you a little bit of that. This is French drum music. This is at the same time as not cracking. They're already applauding. So this is kind of sort of a wall.
And the other thing you must not show, and this is where the true great artists come in and you tell them, you must not show that you're out of breath ever. <sighs> From all the stuff you're having to do, all the things you're trying to arise, all the physical motion, you have to show us that you're at peace physically all the time. sort of be talking and then Sean would turn, actually the guy, would, the new guy would usually turn first. He'd go up on what they call Denny Point, you just the ball of your foot. And he'd be like one, two, three, down. And then the next, next guy, one, two, three, down. Next guy, one, two, three, four, down. And then Sean would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then down. And after I saw that happen, I asked uh, one of the dancers, I said, is he helping them learn how to turn? She said, no, he bet each one of them a six pack who could turn the most? Because <laughs> he was a natural turner. And so he was like, I, I bet I can turn more than you. Okay, I'll take that bet. He had one, two, three, down, sucker. One, two, three, down, sucker. And then he would just do 12 and be like six pack, six pack, six pack. <laughs> um, and I watched him do it multiple times to, to just guys walking into a buzz saw. They just had no idea they were getting taken. Um, so this guy here is clearly a natural turner, although you can always be better at it. So he was assigned this. You can see how many times he could just go up and sh 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 face front and then down like he meant to target himself. Well. So I said that the woman gets. Uh, this is a, another concise little variation. This is her in 
intro music. This is a famous variation for young, but advanced young dancers. They will learn this. So what the dancer tries to do is she tries to get her legs at 180 when she jumps. There. Let me take a snapshot of the top of the jump. Her legs would be at 180. There you go. While the front foot is pointed and the back foot is also pointed. Notice her feet, she's going to do some of these little minor hops on point. So this part of this choreography is to show off this part of the body here. They get the, the lines and the point work. And then there's a summation, so we have the autograph, revelation, the revelation, and the code. And this usually is up tempo. see the review written by the critic the next day, and they said she only did 31. They were counting, because it's a famous bit of choreography, and you know what to look for, and the person was counting. When, what she does is she spots, right? So her body turns, then her head whips around, her body turns, and then her head whips around. That's called that spotting. They look at a, they actually mount a red light in the audience, uh, like on the balcony, where people can't really see it. And the dancer uses it because everything's black otherwise. And the dancer uses the spot. So she's actually not just looking off into nowhere. There's a red light in the audience. And that's how her, she doesn't get dizzy, by the way, is <laughs> spotting. Okay, go Especially like when I'm in the pit conducting and I'm hearing people behind me just hooting and hollering, they're so into it. Alright, let's go to the next uh, section. I want to make sure we're about that here. Okay, so now this next section here. Um, actually, skip to this one here. Yeah, and then we'll come back. Go ahead. So there, there are solo variations and there are pa, pas de deux. There's also pas de trois, pas de quatre. Three, four, out of sync, out of cease, and then after that you get to ensemble work. Um, so that is partially what composers and choreographers think of: is they want to vary what the audience looks at most of the time, especially if it's a longer work like Nutcracker. So sometimes you're looking at one person dance, two persons dance, or you're looking at a group of people. Uh, there's also two other broad categories of ballet, which is a ballet that tells a story or a ballet that doesn't. And a ballet that doesn't, we just call that abstract ballet, meaning you're just there to watch people dance. Um, 
and the other one would be programmatic, meaning you're just watching a program, you're watching a story. We just call it story ballet, and if it, 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 we just would say, is it a story ballet or not? Of the eight ballets I've written, seven of them are story ballets. One of them is abstract, meaning just here's a scene for you to watch people dance. Uh, most people like to go see story ballets because they're trying to follow something that they want to be able to follow along. Uh, so Stravinsky writes this ballet called The Rite of Spring. And what this ballet is that we just saw, it's not tutus on the girls and tiaras and, and tights on the guys, and it's not like that at all. This was written, believe it or not, you're going to see this, but this was written over 100 years ago, in 1913, at their premiere of this piece. Um, well, this was in Paris, by the way. At the premiere of this piece, what happened was that the, the choreographer, a guy named Diaghilev, this choreographer had a real eye for talent. He could spot great composers and great dancers, and he would get them together, to, and they had this ballet company called the Ballet Russe, meaning people who left Russia <laughs> during the revolution, the communist revolution. And um, he wanted to create sort of new things about ballet, kind of up, you know, up in the cart, do something different. So at this premiere of this ballet, you have Stravinsky in the pit conducting, the composer himself conducting. And then the dancers on stage dancing. And the audience is, half of the audience is booing this ballet. Like they think it is terrible. Another component of the audience is trying to shut up the people who are booing. A fight breaks out between these two camps of people. And it spills out into the street, and the riot police have to be called during the premiere of a ballet. This is how seriously, especially at that time period, the French took their art form. And really, they considered ballet their art form. Like, jazz is our art form in America. We created it. They feel, now the Russians would argue with them, but they feel that ballet is their art form. And here it was, what they were doing to it. And so I tell students, you can remember this, because right of spring sounds like riot of spring. It's easy to kind of remember those two things together. So here's what I'm going to show you a little bit of. What this ballet is about is about a pagan sacrifice. They are actually going to show us they're going to kill somebody at this pagan sacrifice in this ballet. Um, I'm going to kind of not show you that part, but I want to show you a little bit of the setup to it that caused people to be really freaked out about this. So if you don't mind starting here, you might recognize this if you've seen Fantasia, because this is a bit in Fantasia. That is a bassoon, super high. Now, if you just saw that other ballet that I 
Richard and Don Quixote. And then you are expecting that you buy your ticket for that. This is what happens on stage. And you're particularly old school. I'm here to see a ballet. I want to see the pretty women, the athletic men. What is this? Now, try to count with it in your mind. We got a pretty steady sense of pulse, but where the heavy beat is, is moved. Stravinsky keeps moving the sense of where one is. So, so, Whereas dance prior to this had a very sort of consistent rhythm, like that waltz that I was playing, two, three, two, three, two, three, or Nutcracker, you heard, boom, yum, dun, 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 that's in four, yum, dun, dun, yum, dun, dun. Well, in this one, Stravinsky keeps shifting the time over by a beat or subtracting it, and so the dancers it had a devil of a time, even just trying to feel the beat, like know where they're supposed to move to apply their choreography. So during this riot that breaks out at the premiere, Diaghilev is off stage yelling the counts, by the way, at the same time to the dancers. One, one, no, four, four, you know, because they're trying to figure out when to do their thing. So X out of that, you know, please. I don't know why this uh, orchestra, come go left, go left one more, there you go. Go ahead, full screen. I don't know why this, the London Philharmonic put this together, but this is one of my favorite things ever, for now. Um, here you go. It's like a DDR or uh, Guitar Hero. This is the sacrificial dance. This is the end of the battle. Thank you, whoever. <laughs> 